He didn't have the first in success. He worked in public. It means and quiet with he. I kept busy by working out a book about Eric Satie, and I came across a remark of his, which I couldn't translate well at first. But now I have, I think, a good one. It's, um, it, it's not good manners to discuss the point of the question. It's not marvelous. Teachers, you might say, how to be. Seien wir Künstler, ohne es sein zu wollen. Die Idee kann ohne die Kunst auskommen. I had promised Schoenberg that, that I would devote my life to music, which I loved. I loved sounds, but I had no feeling for harmony. But not all of the sounds are involved in harmony. All the noises, for instance, are outside the reach of harmony. So I began by literally beating, not, if not my head, uh, beating other things or scraping them, or so on, in order to produce sounds. I was, uh, I think inspired is the right word. I was inspired by Oscar Fischinger, who said that everything in the world has a spirit, and that that spirit is released by th that thing's being set into vibration. I'm also very impressed by the idea of uh, Marcel Duchamp, that a work of art is not completed by the artist, but is completed by the listener hmm? mm -hmm. or the observer. So that um, it can change from one person to another. And there were, there were roses all down here.
and I want to be free of the memory. Uh, that was also one of Duchamp's um, ideas. He said to reach the impossibility of uh, transferring the memory imprint from one like object to another. For instance, if you see two Coca-Cola bottles, not to look at one and then at the other and think that the other is the same as the first, but to look at them squarely and see that they're two different bottles, hmm? two different Buddhas, hmm? mm -hmm. because the light is falling on them differently and they're not the same. And it's only the memory or the thinking that makes you think that that you could ignore the second one because it's the same as the first, it isn't. René Char, too, the French poet, said each uh, act is virgin, even the repeated act. What's the number on uh, one to ten? Three. Three. So you have to have a hot spot of about here. Okay. Oh, there. Can you see the paper? Yes. <laughs> now, Shara, is the edge going to be soft or hard? Um, soft. Can you make the edge soft? I'll try. Hmm. That's yeah. better. Good. Now, is it going to have a circle or a cut? Um, round. Circle. Okay. It's going to be round. So it's done. I did chance operations in my database at home to uh, assign uh, one of four types of lights. That was what was offered to us by the rental company. There's 112 of them. That's a multiple of 14, 8 times 14. Eight's a nice computer 8-bit number. Uh, those chance operations on the database gave us the 112 positions um, in the grid and also the distance below the grid and the type of light. And as you can see out the window, um, all the light is connected from the grid or the grid down. We have vertical pipes dropping down from the grid. Nothing is on the floor. I thought the floor would be busy enough for the cameramen with the musicians and the chairs and the music stands and the mic stands. I've tended to think of lights uh, like instruments or like notes as events that happen in time. And they're, I, I composed the trajectory for each light from the beginning of the piece to the end of the piece and then went and did another light and another light in the same way that John Cage wrote 14 parts for this piece one part at a time each part from 0 to 20. There's one thing at the end of it, the two girls who died were not diving at the same time. But they died in his arms. Carol and the transfer. We learned long ago to work together without stepping on one another's toes. And then you, you take the time as, a, as an empty uh, empty space in which anything can, can go. And, and uh, Merce works as I do, and uh, as you do now, with chance operations, so that um, what we always tried to make was the best decision. But it, this uh, use of chance operations uh, 
assumes that each thing that happens is the best. <laughs> Um, there was one um, uh, man who came up, uh, um, not so much angry, but, <laughs> but um, uh, displeased after a performance of the music and the dance, and said to uh, John Cage, who was in the pit, uh, is it your idea that the music and the dance uh, are separate? And John said, yes. And the man said, then, is it not possible for them to be performed in different places? And John said, yes, that would be possible. And the man said, why don't you do that? And John said, well, it's for your convenience, so you can experience both things at the same time. And. Um, the man was uh, stopped. <laughs> Not quite know how to carry the conversation on. What you can see on the screen here is a, a digital representation of what's going on out the window. This light, as you can see, whoops, it just moved. This one's been sitting still for a while at 70. That means it's from one cue to the next, it not only didn't go away, but it didn't change. Now, inevitably, there, it jumped from 70 to 10 very quickly over one cue. So that's a case of a light not being pulled out of the cue, but changing in the cue. Now it's been sitting at 10 for a little while. Boom, it's jumping rapidly to full, 100%. And then eventually it'll disappear. In the same uh, process, uh, the same day, in fact, that I did all the light positions, I also by chance positioned the musicians. That was done by picking the spot again on the same grid, only in this case it's the spot on the floor directly under the grid indicator, uh, where the musician's chair would be. And then I did a 360 degree rotation on the chair, so some of the musicians are pointing in odd directions. I read through Finnegan's Wake and listened and made a list of the sounds I heard that were mentioned in the book, like dogs barking and so on. And I found something like 5,000 sounds, listed them, and then I put those in categories and then tr asked people to give me sounds of those, babies crying, dogs barking, etc. And then another book was published, which um, 
And those you see could be listed page in line and put in where they belonged in my poem. Then there was a book published which listed the places mentioned in Finnegan's Way. And one could go to those places and make records. Or you could write to a, a um, radio station in Japan or in uh, Sumatra to get a sound from a small city near, near Singapore, for instance. <laughs> that way we collected everything we needed. When the house burned, he used the burned house as his laboratory. <laughs> and we lived in the garage here. And I lived in this part of the garage, which was the washing rooms. And mother and dad lived in the part just beyond, which was for the automobile. <laughs> and I liked that because it brought me very close to them. accepted the idea that, that the purpose of music was to sober and quiet the mind, thus making one susceptible to divine influences. And this uh, reason for making music was given me by um, Gita Sarabhai, uh, an Indian musician, who said that that was what her teacher had told her was the purpose of music. Therefore, it was the traditional purpose from ancient times. And the question that, that arises, if you accept that purpose, the question is, what is mind? And what is a sober mind? And what are divine influences? So I was, um, I wanted to find out and I read first a, a book of Aldous Huxley's called The Perennial Philosophy. I had already read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. And um, Huxley pointed out that all the various religions were, um, were the same, that they simply had different flavors. So in his book, you were able to taste all the various ones, and I found the taste of Zen Buddhism more to my liking than any other. So, it, just as I made that decision, Suzuki came to the United States and to New York City t to teach the philosophy of Zen Buddhism, and I went to his classes for two years. And he put on the blackboard one day a, an oval with two parallel lines halfway up the left-hand side. And he said, referring to the whole drawing, he said, this is the structure of the mind. And those two parallel lines are the ego, or mind with a little m, whereas the whole drawing is mind with a big m. And he said the ego has the capacity to cut itself off from the rest of mind or to flow with it. And it does that by uh, developing uh, likes and dislikes, taste and memory. And if you do as Zen wants you to do, get uh, free of your tastes and memory and likes and dislikes, then you have to uh, dis discipline yourself.
some hidden from hibiscus. the story of, of, um, of Beckett and the ten greatest books. He was asked to list the ten greatest books of the 20th century, and he made a list, and it didn't have uh, Finnegan's Wake in it, or Joyce even in it. And um, he was asked why Joyce wasn't included, and he said he's on an entirely different level. I think he's def definitely the greatest of uh, most essential book of the 20th century. My discipline was that of the I Ching and shifting my responsibility from making choices to asking questions and getting the answers by means of um, the ancient coin tossing method of the I Ching. Now I have it in the computer. Joyce himself said that the best thing to do when reading it was to read it out loud. So that he, he himself was a musician, he sang beautifully. Uh, the F Finnegan's Wake uh, could be pronounced in so many different ways, so that the It's hard to say what I want to say, but instead of having one sound, it has uh, a whole, a whole uh, uncounted sounds. These used to be uh, eucalyptus trees back here. And the fields were full of poppies. Thank you. 
I'm not, I, I'm not interested in myself, in my work being communication from me to a listener. I want it to be from the sounds themselves to the listener, so that I make a music for which I am not so much the composer as the listener, too. Mm -hmm. hmm? I want this, the music to come from the sounds. I became impressed with many of the ideas basic to Zen Buddhism, particularly um, that each being, whether a being having senses, as we do, or whether a being having no senses, like this microphone, hmm, mm -hmm. is the Buddha. And each Buddha is at the center of the universe, in which uh, creation is seen as a multiplicity of centers, all in interpenetration and non-obstruction. says in the in the preface that uh, the percussion instruments are distinguished from one another but not named they should all be very resonant and are bowed or played with a tremolo such that individual attacks are not noticeable suitable instruments are like the following chinese and turkish turkish cymbals japanese temple gongs tam tams thunder sheets bass marimba tones and balinese gongs upside down on pads um, so he really leaves the choice of the percussion instruments up to the player with these restrictions, uh, which he does in, in uh, most of his pieces. I didn't like um, the theory of harmony because it excludes noises from entrance into music. Whereas I think that music should be open to anything that we can hear. I think uh, to compare it with society, the musical sounds were like the rich people and noises were like the poor people. And I think we need to change our governments so that the poor people have a chance. If we're going to continue, we need a world which is not divided between the rich and the poor, but which uh, tries to make a life that is good for everyone. And so I want to make a music that is open to all sounds. <laughs>
And as you can see, each time bracket consists of two sets of times. Um, first, you've got here the times between which you have to start the material in the time bracket, which is one note here. Um, so you have to start it any place between 30 seconds and one minute on your stopwatch. And it has to end um, somewhere between 50 seconds and one minute and 20 seconds, which means that the note can never be longer than 50 seconds, which is from the very first um, entrance point till the very last point of exit. And there is no minimum length in principle between, because um, in the bits between 50 seconds and one minute, uh, a note can have any duration. And then this whole process goes on through the whole piece, so through all these 22 time brackets, and then it ends in this case at 20 minutes exactly, which is the maximum length of the piece. Not all parts have this maximum length. Some, some parts have um, a shorter, play a shorter piece almost, like the first violin part whose last time bracket ends at 18 minutes and 40 seconds. So the first violin player always is silent the last one minute and 20 seconds of the piece. There's a, a, a story in Zen Buddhism that I like. Um, a Zen monk and a Christian monk come to a stream, and the Christian monk goes ahead and walks on the surface of the water. And the Zen monk gets very excited and says, come back. And the Christian says, why? And he said, that's not the way to cross the stream. <laughs> and the Christian said, how should you cross the stream? And the Zen monk says, follow me. So they go to a place where the stream is shallow and they wade across. <laughs> I don't see the reason for things being in a line. Mm -hmm. It seems to me we're in an, more in an ocean of possibilities. It's not a mainstream. Uh, did you read what Martin Feldman had to say about me in this 21 pages? He said, uh, the thing I've done, I'm not saying this myself, he said it, I've, I've said in capital letters, the mainstream stopped here. Mm -hmm. Or the way I would put it is that the river is in delta. There are many possibilities and that we may even have left the river and gone into the ocean. And this, I think, is also what is being said at the end of Finnegan's Wake, that um, Anne Olivia is, has gone into the ocean.
shouldn't do in an ideal case, which is rarely, I think, but what you shouldn't do is react on what you hear around you, because you've got your own part, and the interaction must come through chance, and not because you hear someone uh, play a note and think, oh, this is, this is nice, I'll play mine now. You just have to let it happen. Once I went into um, an anarchic chamber. This is a room made as silent as technologically possible. And in that room, I heard myself. And that was two sounds, the high sound and the low sound. And the high sound, they explained to me later, the high sound was my nervous system in operation. And the low sound was my blood uh, circulating. It's like a river flowing. Mostly music is based on the idea that, that the heart beats. But it doesn't do that. It does if you find it. If you push the pulse, it beats. But otherwise, it just flows. So that our sense of rhythm nowadays is not uh, like horses on a going, but it's more like airplanes uh, move through space. What I like to do, uh, in, even in a situation like this, is uh, listen to the sounds around me. All those people opening doors, or, and the, there's a kind of a humming sound, you hear it. But it doesn't seem to be absolutely constant. It, um, or at least there's so many things going on at the same time that the that 
the uh, situation is very full of variety. Years ago, I was asked not by a Dutchman, but by a, a German, what was the purpose of music. And I said that I didn't deal in purposes, that I dealt in sounds. But I think now, I might say that the, the purpose of music As it, as it always was, is to bring about an enjoyment of the life that we're living. And that life now, I think more than at any other time in history, involves a mind. Our technology has not extended our capacity to move from one place to another but has, uh, has extended what uh, McLuhan called the central nervous system, so that the whole um, of creation now is like a, a single mind. And that mind, Well, needs to come to terms with itself so that it's not split against itself and so that that uh, can be the enjoyment of being alive with all the other people on the same planet. <laughs> 